G'day. Before investigating Oracle Mobile Cloud Service custom APIs in more detail, in this Technology Primer episode today, for anyone who hasn't been exposed to the concepts yet, we're going to succinctly cover REST and JSON at a high level so you get a grounding of what they are, what they do, and why they're important to MCS and mobile apps in general. Thanks for having me along today. My name's Chris Muir. I'm from the Oracle Mobile Platform team. Alrighty, so let's dive right in and answer the question, what is REST? So academics will refer to REST as an architectural style for networked hypermedia applications to interact. Predominantly though, REST is known as a web service technology, comparable to that of SOAP, but with its own specific qualities and benefits. All right, so then you're probably asking, what is web service? Well, essentially a web service is a callable API, typically published on the internet, but certainly on a network for machine to machine interactions with the primary goal of sharing data. Also making systems interoperable based on using the internet as a delivery platform, utilizing the internet standards and low cost everywhere access that the internet provides. Oh, and by the way, web services are also loosely coupled to boot. Now, if that doesn't sound awesome, sounds pretty awesome to me, I don't know what does. But as we mentioned earlier, a well-known web service technology, particularly in the enterprise space that Oracle plays in, is that of SOAP, which at some point time meant simple object access protocol. But this simplicity became a bit of a joke, as thanks to its implementation of sophisticated but complex security policies for traditional enterprise systems, and also very heavyweight payload structures based on XML, it moved away from its original goals. So alternatively, REST is the more contemporary and de jure choice for web service implementations. One of the many places that REST shines is in mobile interactions with servers thanks to its lightweight payloads, simple security model, and also a very low learning curve. As such, REST is particularly suited to the use of, well, Oracle Mobile Cloud Service. So again, the question is, well, what is REST? Well, REST stands for, and it's a mouthful, representational state transfer, and it's an architectural style to defining, publishing, and consuming APIs and services on the internet using HTTP. You'll often hear such APIs being described as RESTful, indicating the style of the service. Now, from my layman's perspective, um, oh, hang on, no, 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 that's not appropriate. I'm a technical product manager. Um, from the expert mind of an Oracle product manager, I like to think of REST as a high level protocol for exchanging data across the internet in a computer and a human friendly way, rather than defined at the network layer, which is mostly understood by boffins. Now this is pretty neat as this makes REST very easy to learn and teach. And as a surprise, you'll discover that as a computer savvy user, you're already actually familiar with the main REST concepts. Who knew you're already a REST expert? So, as REST utilizes the HTTP protocol, the same protocol your browser uses to access web pages, the first REST concept which you need to know about that you're already familiar with is that of resources. So traditionally via browser, you might get a website and its pages like HTTP cloud.oracle.com forward slash mobile slash index.html. As a URL, it identifies the protocol, HTTP, the server, cloud.oracle.com, a path, mobile, and a resource, index.html. In this case, a web page, which is a specific media type. Now on your behalf, your browser is requesting or getting a web page, a human readable media for you to enjoy. But beyond browsers, there's nothing to stop, say, a mobile application requesting HTTP resources from a server too maybe a web page, maybe a text file or image or JSON file, and processing that file in the background to extract the data. In other words, your mobile apps are consuming resources on the internet just like a browser, but it doesn't have to show the content, it can consume the content as a service and do something in the background. So just like a browser, a mobile app or any program can send a HTTP payload as part of a request to the server and the server then responds with a the HTTP payload itself. This can occur multiple times, request, response, then later request, response, request, response, and so on. Now, if we dig into those payloads, an example HTTP request from the client to the server may look like the following. First, it identifies itself as a HTTP version 1.1 payload. Then the client identifies that it is issuing a GET request on the server, which is one of the several HTTP verbs supported get, head, put, 
post and delete, amongst others, that the client may execute as operations on the server. Now these verbs are executed against a resource, which is identified by first the host, which the resource lies on, cloud.oracle.com, then a path, forward slash, mobile, and finally resource, in this case index.html. In addition to the payload, the client will include a number of HTTP headers, which are standardized tokens for allowing the client to both identify itself and its capabilities, and in turn indicate to the server what it requires. A specific interest in this example is the accept header, which allows the client to state what type of payload it wants in the response, in this case a text HTML file. Finally in this initial request to the server, there isn't any payload carrying data. We'll see an example of this in a moment. From here, assuming the request gets to the server and the server is able to correctly interpret the request and send a response, the server will return a HTTP payload in turn. Of significance is the status code, sometimes referred to as an error code, but it's normally a status code, which indicates if the server was successful in processing the request, returning a 200 status code, as we see here, or a range of other error codes, such as 404, resource not found, or redirections to other internet resources, and so on. Finally, beyond the HTTP headers which are included in the response, it also may include an actual payload. In this case, as the client requested a text HTML resource, and the server has found such a resource, it returns a HTML file in the payload. So the really big takeaway in understanding REST, which is based on HTTP, is that resources are our primary REST concept. And for a machine-to-machine -machine interaction, we may publish and separately consume resources like here, host slash path slash departments. So with a get, this would probably return a list of departments, their IDs and names, say, in a JSON payload. Now, we haven't talked about JSON yet, but we'll talk about that more in a moment. Now, another resource from the same server could be HTTP host path employees, which, like the departments resource that we just talked about, allows us to say get a list of employees, their IDs, names, and other details. Now, we can go further and extend the resource and URL to retrieve a specific item from the resource. For example, in this URL for the department's resource, we then further requested a specific department HR, or we could have asked for finance or procurement by including its name in the URL. Or in this example, we're specifically asking for the employee details of the employee identified by the ID 101. So head, path, employees, 101. Overall, you can see the URL structure used by REST resources is based on something that you already know from your use of URLs in browsers. It's this human readable and intrinsic knowledge that you have of URLs that REST relies upon to make the learning curve, well, actually very gentle indeed. So with the examples above, thanks to the knowledge that you already have and the intuition that you already have, you might try the following URL, HP head, path, departments, HR, employees. Now it's possible you might not get anything back but a 404 error status code because it depends what the server's actually configured to return. But the flip side is it's a good guess based on a pattern of how you know URLs work. And this makes REST easy to work with. While the services that are available are dependent on what the REST service provider provisions, this intuitiveness of the URL schemes reduces the learning curve significantly. Now, you might think in the acronym REST that R stands for resource, but you'd be incorrect. It actually stands for representational. So what does that mean? Well, representational implies that in making a request for information from a resource, you can ask for information in different forms, essentially different representations of that data. In other words, if you were building a website for users to access from a browser, the browser will request that a resource served by your website was served as a HTML page. But alternately, if you requested, you might, it might serve an image, or maybe a text file, or a file containing XML or JSON. This ability to request data in different forms works in favour of our mobile apps too. And both the browser and mobile app can request different data formats using the HTTP header value of accept, followed by a specific MIME type, indicating the media type the client is asking for. So for example, the header parameter of accept image forward slash GIF, well, what that would return is the client wants a GIF image back. 
In turn, accept application forward slash JSON. This implies the client would like return the result or the result to be a JSON encoded file. Now again, it's up to the server to implement the media types and it may not support them all. But generally speaking, the client, such as your mobile app, will implicitly know what is supported by the server thanks to your own testing and, document and the documentation that's available. All right, so at this point, I've mentioned JSON several times. So it's probably a good point to discuss, hey, what is JSON? So JSON is a standard using human readable text to transmit data objects of attribute value pairs. Now it is typically used for machine to machine communications, such as mobile app to server communications, and is a contemporary replacement for the older XML standards. Now amongst all the different episodes you've been watching, you've probably seen JSON examples already, but let's have a look at a further one that I borrowed from Wikipedia to explain the main concepts. So in this JSON document, first of all, notice the ellipse brackets used to group the data collection stored within the JSON payload. Then the list of attributes double quoted like first name, last name, and so on. Now these are typically paired with a value, which if it's a string, it is also double quoted after a colon like the values John and Smith. Alternatively, booleans and numbers are also supported without quotes as well as nulls. In turn, each attribute and its values are comma delimited. JSON also supports hierarchical payloads in that you can see in this example the address attribute is further composed of attributes like, well, street address, city, and so on. It also supports arrays of attribute values, comma delimited between square brackets. Again, in this example, you can see the array of phone numbers where each element is represented by a type and a number. Alternatively, we can see that we have an empty array when considering John's children. Lucky John, I wonder what he does with all that spare time. Anyway, overall, the format of a JSON file is very easy to read, and this is one of its key qualities. Unlike its predecessor, XML, it's free of a rather bloated tag notation that means the payloads in text have only a small amount of overhead to represent its hierarchical structures, though it can still easily be validated like an XML document. As a result, JSON is a very popular choice for sharing data via REST APIs, and particularly well suited to mobile to server interactions where mobile devices have tight bandwidth requirements. Returning to our discussion of REST APIs, the next key concept we want to talk about is that of operations, or those that are supported. So in other words, when we retrieve a list of employees from the server, say HP, host, path employees, what operations do we need to call? Or when we want to add an employee to a resource, well, what operation do we use in that case? Well, as REST works over the HTTP protocol, the HTTP protocol uses the standard HTTP verbs or operations of get, put, post, delete, head, and so on. Now, there are a few more, but we won't discuss them here. They'll be on the discussion. Now, as you can probably guess, the first one you can use is the get operation on a resource to retrieve the objects from that resource. Now, typically this will reward the client with a payload. Alternatively, the post command is used by the client to create a new resource on the server. In this case, the client will give a payload to the server. The put command in turn is used for updating existing resources on the server if they already exist, or otherwise a new object is created, much like the post command we just talked about. Now, guess what? The delete command, well, it deletes a resource on the server, leaving us with the head command to discuss, which is a little obscure. Now, the head command is similar to the get command, and that allows you to access a resource. However, you only receive the metadata about the resource back, such as the HTTP headers described in the resource, you will not receive the resource itself as a payload on the response. So why would you need this? Well, say you wanted to check a resource exists, but you don't care for a copy of the resource. Or alternatively, you wanted some of the metadata about the resource back, such as the e tag HTTP header, which supplies a version number of the resource. Both of these are examples of why you use the head command. Now beyond this, the final basic REST concepts that we need to talk about is that of status codes, sometimes referred to as error codes, returned from the server's response. Now the HTTP standard defines a significant amount of status codes. You look at on Wikipedia, there's just like 50 or 100 of them. But for simplicity's sake, all of them are grouped in ranges of 100, and they all have implicit meaning within those ranges. So to start out with, generally speaking, the 100 series status codes are informational status codes, where the client and server in communicating to each other give each other messages to continue well, working or switch protocols or some sort of handshake. And to be honest, to start out with discussing the 100 series status codes, it's, they're not the most interesting codes to start with. Where it does get interesting is the 200 status codes. 
Rather, the 200 series status codes indicate a successful call between the client and the server, where 200 means the server responded, okay. And alternatively, 201 implies a new resource was created on the server, which would be the result of a pull or a post. Or 202, the call was accepted successfully, and the server will continue to process the request in the back end, and so on. Now, the 300 series of status codes are used for when requesting a resource from the server, and the server says, well, the resource has moved. Please try an alternative URL. It's a redirection. So a 300 series code is neither a success or failure. The client has still more work to do with the server by requesting more resources. The next set of uh, status codes is that of errors, the 400 and 500 series of error codes. The 400 series status codes indicate an error on the client's part. For example, the most commonly known error code is the 404 unknown, implying the client has requested a resource from the server, but the server says, well, I don't know what that is. Alternatively, a 403 forbidden implies the client is requesting a secured server as a resource, but the client doesn't have the correct privileges to access it. Finally, the 500 series status codes indicates an error on the server side. And you might be familiar with the dreaded 500 internal server error, for example, which implies that the server failed to process the request because of an unexpected condition that it can't solve and it can't continue. Well done, you've now learnt the basic concepts of REST, which are, they're designed to allow programs to share data, including mobile apps with servers via the HTTP protocol. They work on the concept of URL resources, which you operate on. The operations are based around the standard HTTP verbs, get, put, post, delete, and head. In the, request, in the request, the client can request via the accept parameter, different response payloads, such as application JSON files. And along with the payload response, the server includes a status code. So we certainly haven't covered all the REST concepts today here, but this will hopefully give you the solid grounding in the basic concepts. Thanks for joining me. I'm Chris Muir. I hope we'll see you in the next videos very soon.